Hey. Hi. I'm also on my phone, but I'm using the excuse that I'm being green and not just lazy. <laughs> um, also, Ooh. it's the 21st century. Like, let's... <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. This is called Of World. There, is, there are many poems. The first one is called Of World. An open stranger has the wild memories, cool like songs attempting life and naming. Study like the stranger approaches you under a given sun. Cold novel lies. My accident is a major play. Darkness like entertainment, please. A normal fantasy angled at a bright ray of transferred propagation, easy like a flow chart. Thank you. Uh, this next one is untitled. Go into the watch, and literally nothing else is major. History and atrophy, the old and the real poor, like a bookcase. It's centennial. Why we keep talking about it instead of chopping wood or growing beards? Other lists of symbols for Russia, and symbols for Russia, and the enamored by useless, all of our difference, incredible old. Uh, this one is called No Just Bombs. No, just bombs. And a shrinking man's speech, fractals, and light is hindered, would be really cool. Anything planet-sized is too much. Goth child in a suit. Also Berlin being watched, but Katy Perry never shared those feelings about the NSA. Um, these are slightly funnier now. Uh, it's called Say the Words 808 Drum Again. This guy in the music video for Your Love Is My Drug is obviously a Christ figure. He's pretty ugly though. Check out that crossfade. I've never had this much fun in a desert, but I also never had sex with the central figure of Christianity. Kesha said the word crisis, like Christ-is, like super suspiciously. The shitty 2010 green screen won't hide all of your flaws. And I said this to the music industry, but they just sent me a picture of Kesha riding an elephant. I don't know. Uh, this one, I, I guess I'm like tentatively titling it Chekhov lol, but like with a sad emoticon face afterwards. Um, I'm really dizzy and I just titled my term paper Check Off Lol with, with the same sad face. <laughs> also, dumb white boys continue to be dumb white boys. The word representation can represent Russia too. Don't let that stop you, BB, you look great. I do love the stars, but not much else. This guy on Grinder doesn't really understand satire. When is the point where water isn't enough? Or coffee? Chekhov was like, I'm an artist. This is art. And people ate it the fuck up. Why don't people eat me the fuck up? Now I'm thinking about something else like, like ass or why even people make shitty wine? I don't even know. And this last poem, this last poem I, I taped to the wall in front of my friend's toilet in her new apartment. So every time she has to sit down, she has to read the poem. And it's down now, so I'm gonna put it back up. Um, my headstone is gonna say, ha 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 ha, well, I touched other people's wieners. And maybe it'll bring the cemetery a lot of attention and money, but maybe they don't even need it because it's like a government thing. I don't know. That's it. <laughs>
like this chair. Uh, this poem is called Lilith. This is the first time I saw her. I was seven and I woke up that morning with somebody else's head on my shoulders. I had lied to my mother for the first time. Lied about brushing my teeth the night before. She saw my tongue outline the bones. I imagined yellow flower petals sprouting from my gums, perennial serenity in my mouth. I think she smelled them. I think that's why she followed me here. While my mother cooked pasta al dente, my new friend licked my toes as I swung above the cold tiled floor, orange and olive. That night, she told me her name. I was afraid to say it out loud. The nuns told me the th was bad to say sometimes, unless you were to say, thank God Almighty and the Lord our Savior. I whispered it when I was supposed to be brushing my teeth. While I stayed up late to feed her grapes, green from the kitchen by the light of my closet, I told her I liked her scales and she told me, be careful. She followed me to school the next day my mouth still blooming and my head growing bigger, everyone pretended not to see her and looked at me funny when I laughed in class. I wanted my mother to see her, so I carried her on my shoulders. She mirrored the words that came out of me and my mother pretended not to see her as she sliced up an apple for me, Granny Smith, and poured herself a glass of wine, white. The next time I saw her, her name fit in my mouth complimenting the orchard now growing in my lungs and whispering little warnings when I started walking down the street alone. She encircled the toilet in the girls' room at school when the bowl had food dye, red, swirling around in gooey skin and lost children, at least that's what I thought it was. She told me, it's okay. That's where we met E. E was scared when her stomach started to hurt and her underwear would get ruined, but we told her it's okay. We all become we. Cramped in the sickly pink stall, door clinging to one squeaky hinge, gooey fingers and restless legs, whispers from thousands of years ago, narrating our transition from young to old, too old, suddenly too old for the little girl's room. Suddenly, one day, she disappeared this conscience of mine when the TH finally sounded right and I started to spit out apples, red delicious, throat sore and a head filled with bees, stinging the parts of my brain that remembered her. That's when the ladybugs started crawling into my bathroom from one corner, a colony I emulated, women constantly becoming women, constantly, and butterflies dropping dead in front of me, some sort of self-sacrifice. I took them home and buried them where the worms would pray for their souls, and sometimes those worms would crawl in my ears, trying to get to the apple trees rapidly growing in the black soil of my lungs. I let them. They looked like her, moved like her, slithered, but their green innocence made me self-conscious. I started wearing bras and the apples stopped popping from my mouth, but settled somewhere near my heart. The doctors found a worm in there, somewhere near my nipple. They took him out. I told them to. Maybe it wasn't a worm, I thought. Maybe a caterpillar, maybe soon a butterfly. Maybe it won't be able to grow in there behind the tissue paper skin, white, the self-sacrifice, butterflies dropping dead. What if they take me with them this time? My mother tried to laugh, told me, they'll take care of it. In the passenger seat of her car, I begged the sun to set. I wanted to see what the moon had to say, but she, like my mother, had stopped speaking. I saw Lilith that night in a boy's bed after he had fallen asleep, feeling for the worm wriggling. She weaved herself through his fingers, it tickled. She smiled at him, I think just for my sake. I knew what she saw when she looked at him, but she nodded at me, somehow she always knew. Then I watched as she slipped under the covers like tissue paper, black, and started at my toes counting them, contorting herself to my bone structure. I closed my eyes. For the first time, I forgot to trust her. She paused at each joint, each lump of skin. I was suddenly very aware of myself. She told me, remember what this feels like. Stay like this. It's yours. It will not fight you. 
She started smelling my face or something, started counting my teeth. I told her I didn't have anything to give her, no food, no water. She shook her head, told me, no need, I'll come back. She stood up my face, curving her whole body to my profile. I thought she'd slide into my mouth and rip me open, but she didn't. She laid herself atop my head like a halo and closed her eyes. She wasn't there when I woke up. The next morning, my head was beating. I thought she'd crawled into my ear like those worms, homesick and mourning. That's how I felt, I thought, but it almost sounded like her. My, my bones felt like cherry stems, knotted and thin, twisted by teenage teeth, carmine. When I went to the bathroom, raspberries came out moldy and squeezed, staining the bowl like food dye, red. In this boy's mother's bathroom, I smiled to myself. I tried to remember how her body fit on top of mine, stalking but not hunting, like something she missed, homesick and mourning. I closed my eyes and tried to make my fingers soft, traced my profile, neck to forehead, and I heard her hiss, perennial serenity is a lie. I spread my tongue along my teeth, counted, feeling for each little petal. I felt for the worm again, wriggling somewhere behind my nipple and got anxious, but I told myself, it's okay, they'll take care of it. Thank God Almighty. overflowed with unfertilized dirt. Worms wriggled through my bloodstream in desperate search of nutrients never to be found. I heaved my decomposing dispositions your way and you composted them, cultivating golden philosophies, blooming life into my unfeeling fingertips. You saw my broken smile sowing seeds of wisdom within my lips until buds began to form in the coldest parts of me. My hard exterior grew herbaceous under your warm touch. Chlorophyll flooded my veins, and pruning my thorns away, we blossomed together. Your roots dug into my chest, carving their way into my collarbones, closing firmly around my rib cage and anchoring themselves in my heart. You were as much a part of me as these rings inside, marking how far I've come. Beautiful hybrids with botanical names not yet defined warmed my dead eyes. Bouquets sprouted from every part of me, my foliage dazzling as autumn grew nearer. But winter is harsh and unforgiving, and with it you vanished, taking with you my sunlight, the very air I needed in order to flourish. I plucked petal after lifeless petal from their drooping stems, frantically trying to determine whether or not you loved me. What once were branches withered to twigs, fragile like I began. Spring arrived with a vengeance, my lifeless form not equipped for the poppies, and roses that rose to, to life underneath my skin. I want nothing more than to put you out of my mangled mind, to shed the idea that I need you to grow. I am a tangled monstrosity of ferns and knotted fronds, bound within the twisted and gnarled roots that once made me feel loved. How can I forget you when frail blue forget-me-nots haunt the inside of my eyelids? I am a weeping willow, a mess of matted moss and wilted flowers, you left me alone in the secret garden for the ivy to weave its way around me and coax me slowly earthward again. Thank you. Next is Clara. Yay. So yeah, hi. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm a green person too. <laughs> and also I kind of have to pee too. By the way, there's another useless detail in my life, however. So, um, I feel like you guys deserve this introduction, but like, as you might infer from my blonde hair and blue eyes, I'm Chinese. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And shy, so I, I kind of want to do it like an experiment. So please, just like, I apologize. <laughs> Um, however, yeah, but I'm, ju I'm just gonna start. 
dialogue number three or confession number three to you to you whom i'm losing i'm eager and you are a dead dream collapsing reality is distortion of the ideas through which we look at ourselves i'll never get bored with falling in my mind i will rise love you will never find me to desire i need to hide i will eventually sleep under all the fragments of me i will give you and what comes after failures <clears throat> vorrei che queste parole potessero raccontarti come ti conosco e raccontarmi come non mi hai mai visto and then i'm gonna just like bother you with like the first part of like a really really long thing that's still like an experiment with um chinese <laughs> so yeah <clears throat> i thank my god for allowing solitude to reign as holding the drops of my loneliness i learn about the inconsistency of water shape of my hell think a door Inside, where I will lead you, trust me, we will cross together that sea inside, sea. Inferno, don't fear, follow my voice here inside. Can you hear? Say with me, cross the door with me, trust me. I'd never leave you alone inside, ancora mi servi. When the low tide discloses sometimes a bare land whose center a bent cross, creator of a crooked shadow, twisted hope. Vedrai, soon I'll die, here inside, losing you, artery of my core. Nothing I fear and desire more than you to cross the door with me, would you think? Imagine a cathedral with infinite spires, alive, shaking veins, where blood inside waves, streams evaporate as you step on the leftover seaside. You only eat here, inferno, where also the sand is frozen. Here, a mouth shouts, famale, nowhere you can understand. Until the end, follow me, says the child, Holding your hand tight inside, never leave me, she cries, or I'll die. I apologize, I'm still here, sono. Inside I become more voice, qui, less real, more shadow, ancora. My fear, to head a dark vapor, spring of the crooked fog. I disappear when I fear. Possibilities, obscure smiling faces, dark vapors you might inhale. Chance or destiny, amor fati, infinitely as potentially. As the wake of the missing water now left over as they contrail how the snake crawling after us can always appear. Hissing, spitting desire, poisonous loss of veins, lacking pieces of soul, my cords, those scars. I wish you not testify in this seaside, treading on everlasting memories within the sand, memories you demand. Whisper here, breath at the back, chronic voices like diseases, moving your hair, subtle suspicions, once more evading, once more fading. Nice, and then <laughs> I will have like the last thing that's just like, yeah, the first part. But anyway, the last thing, but since like I can't read, Jacob, can we have like a Cecilia's class moment? Can you read for me? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so since we are like, I ended with the part of like memories, this poem is called Cold prison of memories. You can just, you can just model beside me. <laughs> okay. Don't look at the shapes you've loved as you pass those gates made of tongues. Tied to arms, tied to chest, squatted over eyes that can still perforate the flesh. If you get closer, you'll hear the rustling of those flames that have, in, that have ingurgitated your life. As Prometheus of gloom consumed your immaculate shape, leave perverse ash. Next is Jeff Johnson. Priscilla. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I'm gonna snuggle over here with the dinosaur. So I wanna read from something that, a book that I'm writing right now, um, and it's called The Book. <laughs> It has a prologue, but I'm gonna skip that and we'll go right to the book proper. <laughs> here we are again, dancing around the subject. The book knows we are here. We open it together. The book is witness to every injustice and every aesthetic crime. The book takes what is stolen and returns it to the commons. The book is a record of its own change. That the book has written itself does not mean the book has read itself. The book corrects itself. The book has written but not read itself. The book tired of its own narrative and sought another relation. Tired of its narrative, book strayed from path. Exhausted by metaphor, the book wrote itself out of the forest. How long before the plot loses hold? Is it desirable, for example, to renounce figurative thinking? The plot takes, or loses, hold. The strong arms of the plot, its vice-like grip. Does, the figu does figure ingratiate plot? Is a plainer sentence required? The book cycles through options. The book is not like a machine. The book is a machine, but not anymore. The book remains a contingency. The book returned from an experimental passage. How will the book respond to events? The book wrote itself during the capital regime, amidst brutality and full view of atrocity. The book comes from the 20th century and rewrites itself in the 21st century as the latter rewrites the former and the former projects the latter. The book is formed of events. The book is the capital of atrocity. Music from the next room overlays the air. The book is outside on an errand. The book is outside an errand. The book is accosted, absorbs, exchange. The book can only inflect. Paper's over. The book must be pushed. Just so, the book is slid in front of another. The book pushed in another direction. The book has an idea where this is headed. The book headed off. Yesterday, the book felt heavy. Now it is an empty case. Contents of book. Pages. Ink. Diction. Design. Punctuation. Syntax event, etc. The book contains as well its many versions, what it has been and might be. The book contained by its grammar. The book a politics. The book has rights. Thanks. Next is Claire Donato. So pop back here. Hi. Um, this is so beautiful. Thank you, um, Jacob and Ryan and Hanisha for organizing this. I'm so glad it came together. It has been no small feat. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read a few poems in dedication to you all. Um, they're from Inger Christensen's Letter in April, which was written in 1979. And this book was a collaboration between Christensen, who was a Danish poet um, and an artist named Johan Foss. And these two women met at a residency in Italy and then um, summered together with their children in southern Sweden and wrote this book in collaboration. So I thought it would be apt for the event. Just read a few passages from it. Is this waterfall of images really a house? Is it really we who will live here plunging through the multitude of gods? Live, set the table, and share. Unpacking our belongings, some jewelry, 
a few playthings paper the necessities arranged within the world for a while. And while you draw, mapping out whole continents between the bed and table, the labyrinth turns, hanging suspended, and the thread that never leaves out is, for a moment, outside. Then light pours and suddenly and hides us completely. The sun is round as the apple is green, and they rise and they fall. Already on the street, with our money clutched in our hands, and the world is a white bakery, where we waken too early and dream too late, where streams of raw and unused thoughts come nearest the truth long before they are thought. Meanwhile, winter and summer, and winter again, spent in the company of something as simple as a completely worldless pomegranate that says nothing. And as you sleep and map out whole continents along Sleep River shores, I unwrap the pomegranate from its purple paper and slice it in half. It looks like a kind of brain different from ours. Who knows? Maybe the pomegranate itself is aware that it's called something else. Who knows? Maybe I myself am called something else than myself. Thanks. Chris is up next. I don't like the sound of my own voice, so I'm gonna talk away from the microphone. Can you all still hear me? Hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I wrote. I, did, I originally wrote this just to submit it to Savannah Hampton and Julia Powers' um, poetic intervention or chapbook. I, I don't know which one it is, but I actually like it, which is rare because I. I'm very like self-deprecating, I don't like what I write. But um, so yeah, this is called Selfish Skin. Se <laughs> Sensitive to touch, my skin covers too much of my bones, protects too much of my body, doesn't allow me to feel. The skin of her hands feel real as she traces helixes between my shoulder blades up my neck, her fingers cold as steel. I really want her to break my bones, suck out the marrow. She'll ask me to hold my hand and I'll ask her to bite it and nod my knuckles until the skin breaks and doesn't protect my bones. My body is sensitive to touch the same way I'm hesitant to communicate, to interact with another body. The same way my muscles tense from daily stress. The same way she makes my bones shiver with her whispers. I want her to dissect my being. I want her to analyze my biology and categorize my body. I want her to... Sorry. I want to feel the, ch the chill of a steel lab table. I want to be covered with a white sheet. I really want my entirety to be reduced to ash. I want her to pour all of me into our future cat's litter box and have him kick me out onto the floor after he's done his business. My skin is as sensitive as it needs to be, but I'm very selfish and I always want her body against me. No, you're hot. <laughs> Oh, well, then last but not least was Chris. <laughs> oh, she's here. Okay. Hi, I'm Miyuki, and it's called Dead Batter. Take a breath for a moment. <laughs> I knew a guy in college who had a dead bird in his room. It was an egret that was preserved in a jar. He had to shield the bird from light in order to keep it preserved. For this, he put a box over the jar. It sat on top of his microwave. He showed me the bird once. I was in his room and somehow we got to talking about this dead bird. I told him I wanted to see it, so he pulled the box off. It looked like a bird suspended in yellow liquid, stuffed into a jar just big enough to contain it. Its eyes were closed, and though I knew it was dead, I couldn't help but think if I unscrewed the jar, its eyes would pop open and it would emerge from the jar. 
dripping with yellow liquid and screaming. He told me that he stole the bird from the biology department. He was a friend of mine, a good friend. We often sat in his room and just talked. He had a lot of good stories to tell. I enjoyed just listening to him. I enjoyed his presence. He told me a story from a friend of his who was a paramedic. He said his friend got a call to pick up a guy who was on PCP. While in the ambulance, PCP guy claimed he saw a pink spider. See that pink spider there? He's my best friend. The other paramedics, paramedics decided, the other, par, sorry, the other paramedic decided he wanted to fuck with PCP guy. What, this pink spider? He said pointing to the empty floor. PCP guy nodded. The other paramedic then stomped his foot where he was pointing. PCP guy immediately broke out of his restraints and, punch, and punched him square in the jaw. I felt bad for PCP guy. He once told me that I roll good joints even though I don't. I rubbed this in my brother's face because he would always tell me that I roll shitty joints. My brother said he only told me I was good so he could touch my boobs, even though he never touched my boobs. <laughs> he kissed me once. He said he'd wanted to try it because I was so cute and personable. I blushed when he told me that, but the kiss meant nothing. At least for him it meant nothing. He'd still kiss me sometimes though. It made me feel wet in my pants and pain in my heart. He'd never want me, but I guess he liked to have me around. There were times when he would disappear. He wouldn't answer my texts or calls, and if I saw him on campus, he would avoid me, even if it meant walking in the opposite direction. There were the times I spent, those were the times I spent mostly in bed, crying, wondering what I did wrong. It usually only took about two weeks for him, however, to come back around. I'd get a call and he'd ask me to come, come to his room. He'd never mention why he did that. He'd act as if we just talked yesterday, and I'd act like he, and I'd act like I hadn't been losing sleep over him. My brother never met him, but he became familiar with him nonetheless. I mentioned him just about every time we talked. My brother was also no stranger to his habit of being a ghost. I'd call him crying about how I saw him on campus one day and he ignored me when I waved to him. My brother had grown tired of these calls. You know what your problem is, he said one day. What, I cried. You're putting the pussy on a pedestal. I'm saying what? Putting the pussy on a pedestal, he said louder this time. It took me a long time to figure out what he meant, but it turns out he was absolutely right. I was up in his room after, once after a weekend at home. He asked me how my visit went. I told him it was fine and I had been getting along better with my mother. I went on about how she's been meditating and doing yoga, and even though I find it cheesy, it has a significant impact on her personality. That's great, he said. I'd love to meet her sometime. I laughed to myself. What's so funny? You'll never meet my mother. And why is that? Because, I told him firmly, you keep breaking my fucking heart. Time passed and I met someone else, someone who wasn't interested in breaking my heart. I told my friends about him. I told my friend about him. His reaction was unfavorable. He paused for a moment, stood up, and told me to get out of his room. I just looked at him, confused. I said, get out. I don't understand why. He grabbed the closest thing to him. It was the bird. He threw it towards my head and and some cat-like reflexes that I never had kicked in. I narrowly dodged the jar and it shattered like into a million pieces against the wall. I watched as the pale, lifeless bird skidded its way to the ground. What the fuck was all I could manage to scream? Something seemed to click in his mind as color drained back into his face. I'm sorry, he whispered as he be and began to walk towards me. He never got to me though. I turned away from him and walked out, nearly slipping on the bird jar liquid. I haven't spoken to him since. Shortly after, I asked my new friend if he had any dead animals in his room. He said he didn't. Thanks for coming, you guys. I feel like we have a good family of poets. So thanks for coming to help us begin this, whatever this is.